Hello, my name is Allison and I'm in 11th grade. Hi, I'm Markayla and I'm in 10th grade. Hi, my name is Jesus and I'm in 11th grade. Hi, my name is Grace and I'm in 10th grade. So the thing that I've enjoyed most about being on campus is the really fun atmosphere. Um, you're surrounded with your friends all the time and everyone just really knows each other really well. The campus experience has affected me in the way that um, I feel that I appreciate the little things more. I really enjoyed being around people since it's a small school. It's easy to make friends and also get close to the staff. It's obvious that the faculty really care about the students. I feel that they're kind and understanding and always there if you need to talk to them. Since there's not a lot of students, it's easy to get close to the staff and if I need any help, I can just go to them and they will set up a time to help me with homeworks or any assignments that I missed. The classes have definitely prepared me for what I want to do in life since I want to go into sciences or something related to that. Um, biology and earth science have helped me learn more about it and see, like, confirm that I want to go in there. I like living in the dorm mainly due to the fact that my friends are also in the dorm. I think that um, here on campus people are really willing to help each other out as much as they can and I've really appreciated that. Um, being here on campus has definitely made me a lot more responsible, uh, like doing laundry or getting my homework done. The classes have been pretty fun. They're always a little different every single day and the different learning styles are always appreciated since I learn different ways and at different times. What I like most about the intramural sports are that they're competitive but they're also really fun at the same time. I'm part of yearbook and acro. I, I really enjoy going to yearbook and designing the yearbook pages. Also enjoy going to acro and doing the routines. This way that my relationship with God has grown while being at MPA is through my friends. I think it's obvious that Jesus is a big part of their lives and that really inspires me. Since coming to MPA, my relationship with God has gotten a lot stronger. I've learned who God is to me and that to have a good relationship with Him, I have to put in part and just stay close to Him. I really like service day. I think it just gives me a chance to help the community and show people about God and at the same time get closer to my class. They give me time to do community service that I would like to do that I wouldn't be able to do on my own time. Wherever we go, it's a very warm atmosphere and they always are very encouraging and always have something for us to do. The campus is really pretty. I like how secluded it is from the rest of like the world at times. We don't have like a lot of traffic going in and out and it's always quiet. So I really like the campus here. Um, I think it's very unique, but I think that it's pretty. I really like the mountain view. Um, I can see it from my room and it really makes me happy. Hi, my name is David Wright, and I want to welcome you to Camp Meeting 2021, where we're going virtual. I wish we could be at Lake Junaluska together in person, but since we can't do that, we're going to resort to this. But I think you'll be blessed as you watch uh, the videos of our speaker. Nathan Polk is his name. He grew up in Arkansas, uh, went to Southern for a time. He was the president of GYC Southeast while he was at Southern. Uh, he also did some neat things down in Peru with a friend named Kyle. They did a thing called Rush Peru, where people went door to door for a month uh, talking about Jesus and colportering. Uh, that eventually led into a GYC chapter down there in Peru and setting that up. And hopefully he'll get to share more about that. Uh, he also got his theology degree from Weimar. And now at 23 years old, he's a pastor in the Michigan Conference. Uh, going to get married very soon, as I understand it, to Brooklyn Grignon. And uh, so we're excited to welcome Nathan Polk as our presenter here at Camp Meeting Virtual this year. And I believe you'll be blessed. So again, welcome. 
We're glad that you can tune in, and I hope you enjoy the presentations. Well, good morning, good evening, whatever time of day it is that you are watching this. I hope um, you are watching this. If you're not, you won't know that I hope you are. Um, but <laughs> anyways, my name's Nathan. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you over the next few days from my personal experience from the Word of God. Um, now, I understand, I think that there was some sort of like little bio or video about me, something to where you should know a little bit about me. So I'm going to not talk about myself anymore. Um, and we're going to dive right into what we're talking about today. Um, so first of all, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about two primary things. One of them, the first one's going to be today, and then the second part is going to be over the next couple of days. So what we're going to be talking about today is the importance of making an intelligent decision for or against Christ. In other words, making a decision about whether you're going to follow Christ, not based on what your parents think, not based on what your church thinks, but make that decision based off of what you know to be true. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And then over the next couple of days, we're going to be talking about assuming you do make that choice or you have made that choice or that you are considering making that choice. Um, we're going to be talking about what that looks like on a practical level, both from the Bible, from the spirit of prophecy, as well as from my own experience and uh, the experience of the people that I know. So if you're interested in those things, stick with me. If you think you aren't interested, but you think you might be interested, stick with me. Um, and I, I pray and I hope that this video will be a blessing to some of you, or at least to me or to somebody. <laughs> so I'm not totally wasting my time. Uh, but before we get started, if you don't mind just bowing your heads, kneeling, whatever you may do um, with me as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for giving us this opportunity, giving me this opportunity uh, to film these videos for the Carolina Conference camp meeting. Lord, you know that I want to live for you. I want to serve you. And that choice was made when I was a teenager. And Lord, I have a burden for connecting with young people like myself who are at that, that point in life where they need to make a choice for or against you. And, and so today as we talk about that choice, as we talk about the importance and the relevance of choosing for or against God and, and why we make that choice, I pray that you will send your Holy Spirit and your angels to be present with us, that you will fill us with power from on high. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Choice, 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 choice. It's something I assume and hope that you are experiencing more of. Now, I don't know exactly what age range I'm talking to here. I, I know it's, you know, I assume like late, mid to late teens, somewhere in there. If I'm totally off of, you know, off the mark there, then forgive me. You know, if I'm talking to 50 year olds, you know, forgive me. But <laughs> I need to stop going on rabbit trails. Um, but, but, Assuming that I'm talking to young people like myself, the choice of whether you live for Christ or not is going to be the most important choice you're ever going to make, I believe. Now, you may disagree with me. That's okay. We can argue later. But that is what I believe. I believe the choice for or against Christ is very important, and I believe it's so important that it's a choice you only can make. It's, it's not a choice that your parents can make for you. It's not a, a choice that they should try to make for you. Obviously, when you're a child, when you're young, you know, your parents are going to make a lot of decisions for you. They're going to say, oh, let's go to church, Johnny, you know, whatever. But as you get older, your choice of whether or not you are going to be a Christian becomes more and more and more a choice that you alone have to make. And sometimes people are afraid of that. They they think that if they give young people the choice, and I'm not saying, I'm not, to, be, to be very clear, I'm not encouraging young people here to rebel and say, oh, my mom sent me to an Adventist school, but I don't want to be an Adventist and I'm just going to rebel. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what you believe in your inner heart, in your inner mind. That's something that only you can decide. And people get nervous when the choice is given. Because some people think, well, you know, if people have a choice whether to follow God or not, maybe they wouldn't choose to follow God. But I'm here to tell you that's a risk God was willing to take. In the Garden of Eden, God did not only put good things. Well, yes, he made it all good, but he put a tree of knowledge of good and evil. In other words, he put the option for Adam and Eve to choose to serve God or not to. Freedom comes with risk. 
and God believes in freedom. God is a God of freedom. And so today we're going to be talking about the choice that, that you and I have to make. Turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24, Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. Now, just to give you a little context, you may or may not already know this, but the context of this verse is that Joshua was nearing the end of his ministry, nearing the end of his life, and he was talking to the people of Israel. He was giving them kind of a final address, as it were. Um, and in verse 15, he says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I want you to notice a couple of interesting facets about this verse. To give you a little bit more context of why I think this verse is interesting, let me, let me bring up this point. A lot of times when I hear Adventists encourage young people to question their faith, to challenge their faith, to study out their faith, to choose whether or not there is really evidence to believe in God, a lot of times when I hear Adventists or Adventist speakers do that, it's within the context of study your Bible to know whether Adventism is the correct faith or perhaps Catholicism or maybe you should be a Southern Baptist. That's generally the context in which solidifying your faith is brought up. And that's perfectly legitimate. Each of us should study our Bible and know why, if we are going to be Adventists, know why we're Adventists. But notice in this verse, this, this verse, Joshua is not challenging the people of Israel to decide between two different sects of Judaism, or in our case, two different denominations of Christianity. He's challenging them to decide between serving the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood. Which gods were those? Those were the gods of Egypt. Those were heathen gods. Between serving those gods or the gods of the Amorites, once again, heathen, idolatrous gods, or to serve the Lord. In other words, your choice for or against God needs to be based on evidence and based on looking at not only the different Christian denominations, but recognizing you need to understand why you're even a Christian, why you even believe that there is a creator of the universe, why you don't believe that evolutionary theory explains everything that we see. Your understanding and belief in God needs to be well-rooted in what you know to be true. In other words, simply understanding why you're, why you're an Adventist as opposed to why you are a Baptist is not good enough. You need to know why you're a Christian. You need to know why you're not an atheist. You need to know why you believe in God. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. Studying your Bible is important, and I'm not challenging that, I'm not questioning that, but what I am saying is you need to be able to give an answer for the hope that is in you in addition to to why you were an Adventist. In other words, you don't just need to be able to defend Adventism against other Christian denominations. You need to be able to defend the Bible itself. You need to know if you are to believe in the Bible, if you're going to believe in the God of the Bible. You need to study out and understand and have a clear picture in your mind of why the God of the Bible and the Bible itself is true. And when you do that, you can live up to this verse in 1 Peter, you can be ready always to give an answer to everyone, whether they're a fellow Christian or an atheist or an agnostic or a Buddhist or a Hindu. You can be ready to give them an answer for what you believe, for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Now, some of you may be looking at me and thinking, well, what about faith? Isn't faith simply you know, believing in something that you can't really see? Isn't God something you can't really see? Well, yes and no. Ellen White talks about this in a book called Call to Stand Apart, and she talks about it on page 46. She says, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. So in other words, God never asks us to believe, or in simpler terms, to have faith without giving us 
evidence upon which to base our faith. In fact, she says that his existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established upon testimony that appeals to our reason. There are some people who will tell you that Christianity, and, and these may be fellow Christians, who tell you that Christianity is not a reasonable faith or not a reasonable belief. It's simply something that's based on, you know, this kind of nebulous concept of faith. But Ellen White makes it very clear, and the Bible makes it very clear, that God wants us to believe based on evidence. God does not call us to believe in him simply because he claims to be there. He calls us to believe on him because he's given us evidence upon which to base our faith. Reading on further in this quote from Call to Stand Apart, it says, Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. And so let me make something clear. I'm not saying that in order to believe in God, all of your questions have to be answered. I still have questions. Everyone I know, <laughs> every Christian that I know still has things that don't fully add up to them. I'm not saying that that is a problem. In fact, if we could understand everything there is to understand about God, God would not be infinite. In other words, you and I, at least I know for myself and I assume for each of you, we have finite minds. In other words, our minds are limited, but we believe that the God of the Bible has an infinite mind. He has infinite capabilities. And so we cannot, physically speaking, just as a matter of practicality, we cannot understand everything about an infinite being. So don't get me wrong. There is room for doubt. But on the flip side, there is sufficient evidence. Ellen White makes it very clear, the Bible makes it very clear, that there is sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. And if you and I take the time, and, and I have, but I need to take more time to do this, if you and I take the time to really look at the evidence, to study, and to come to a conclusion as to whether God exists, as to whether the Bible is actually His Word, as to whether or not the Adventist church really is his church, if we take the time to study these things as we go through life and as the troubles come and as the trials come, we will have a firm foundation upon which to base our belief in God. I know I've said this before already, but I'm going to say it again. Faith is based on evidence. That doesn't mean that just because something seems to contradict what we believe, we throw the whole thing out. It means that faith is based on the whole body of our study, the whole body of our experience. And when something comes along that does not seem to be congruent, or in other words, work with our faith, we don't throw out our faith because, as Ellen White says, our faith is based on evidence, not demonstration. Let me give you a really quick example. I know my time is, is running low. An example of what faith looks like. She says it's based on evidence, not demonstration. Imagine with me that you're going to go para-jumping. You know, you're going to go and go up in an airplane, jump out with an instructor, probably if you're doing it for the first time, and uh, you're going to deploy your chute, or the instructor will do that, and you will land safely on the ground. When you get in that plane, you're doing that because you have evidence. You don't have any experience. You don't have any demonstration. You don't have any personal history with para jumping if this is your first time, but you have evidence. You've seen other people jump out of planes safely. Maybe you even know someone who's jumped out of a plane with a parachute with an instructor and landed safely. And so you have evidence to let you know that when you jump out of that plane, you're not just going to become a puddle on the ground. Okay? <laughs> that is evidence. But when you are in the plane and you're standing at the door of the plane and you're about to jump out, your feelings and everything around you is going to be telling you, don't you take that step. Stay in the plane. You're going to die. That's what Ellen White is saying our faith should not be based on. It shouldn't be based on momentary impulse, upon our feelings, upon what seems to be true in the moment. Our faith should be based on on a study of God's word in comparison with science and in comparison with the universe that tells us that there is a God, that there is a God who is real, who is loving, and who does demonstrate himself and express himself through the Bible. We could go to so many more texts, and I'll just give you a couple of references here uh, because we don't have time. Acts chapter 17 
and verse 11 actually encourages and, and says that those who study the scriptures to test new faith are more noble than those who don't. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 encourages Timothy, this is Paul speaking, encourages Timothy to study, to show himself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, God is big enough to be scrutinized. God is not afraid when we take a look at the evidence as it stands because he knows the evidence will lead to him. We have just a couple of minutes left, and so I'd like to, to kind of bring this down in, in, into a more practical sphere. We've talked about how God doesn't want us to be Adventists or to be Christians simply because our parents are. He wants us to make a choice that's based on evidence, but how do we do that? Here's what I would challenge you to do. Look at your worldview. And your worldview is just basically the, the, the set of facts that you know to be true about the universe, about the world. So, quick example. When you wake up in the morning, you kind of rub the sleep out of your eyes and look around. When you step out of bed, you're making an assumption that the, that the floor is going to hold you up, right? That's part of your worldview. You're also making an assumption that you're not going to float away into space. Because you believe in gravity. That's part of your worldview. So your worldview is just the set of facts that helps you to get through life. So I want to challenge you to take a look at your worldview and say, which things do I absolutely know are true? Which things do I have solid evidence for? And, and each of you may already know why you believe in the existence of God. Great. If you know that to be true, then ask yourself, what other things do I know to be true? Do I know that the Bible is God's word? Why? If I know that to be true, what is my evidence? How could I defend that? How do I know it's true? If you know the Bible is God's word, how do I know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church? If I don't know that, should I study it? Wherever you are along that path, in other words, whatever you know to be true, and whatever, you know, in the next step in your worldview you don't know for sure, that's where you need to start. So if you don't know for sure that God is real, then you need to start by looking at the facts to see whether the world as we know it, the universe as we know it, has the fingerprints of an intelligent designer or the smudge marks of random chance. If you don't know whether the Bible you, you do, let's, let's assume that, that you actually do know that God is real, but you don't know whether the Bible is his word, then you need to be asking yourself, well, if there is an intelligent designer, does he communicate with humanity? And if so, could the Bible be that communication? And I believe it is because of prophecy, uh, but, but that's something you're going to have to study for yourself. Wherever you know the truth to lie, in other words, whatever you know to be true, you need to base what you don't know on that. So in conclusion, if you're kind of studying through the, these issues and you're, you're wondering, how do I know what's true? How do I know whether God exists? And you're looking for some resources. I'm going to send a couple of things to the Carolina Conference and I'm going to ask them to maybe attach them to the end of this video. And the first one is a way to contact me. I'm busy at times, but if I were there in person with you, I'd be having time to talk to any one of you that wants to talk to me. And so I, I want to make myself available for that. I've struggled through these questions myself. And so maybe I can help you. So the first thing I'm going to ask them to include is, is a piece of contact information. The second thing is I'm going to ask them to include a list of resources that I'm going to send them. Um, some books that are very helpful in answering some of the questions that we've posed today. But in conclusion, whatever route you choose to take in, in, in doing this study, I just want to challenge you. Don't float through life as an Adventist just because your parents are Adventists. Maybe you're not an Adventist. Maybe your parents aren't Adventists. Don't float through life as whatever you grew up as just because that's how you grew up. Study for yourself. Know why you believe and what you believe. And then when the trials of life come, as Jesus said, the house that is built upon the rock in other words, the house that is built firmly upon a knowledge of God's word, that house will not be swept away. But if you, if you just built upon the knowledge of other people, if you're just built upon 
what your parents want you to believe, if you're just built upon what's convenient, when the things that, that, that are going to come in your life and that are going to come in this world, when those things come, you're going to be swept away. And so I challenge you, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Tomorrow we're going to get into some more practical things. I'm not going to preach to you as much. I'm going to try to make it a little less intellectual. We're going to be talking about how to overcome emotional barriers. Maybe you believe that God is real. Maybe you believe that God is true. But there's something in here that's kind of keeping you from choosing to serve him. We're going to be talking about some of those issues over the next couple of days. So stay with me, if you will. If you, have any, if you have any questions, once again, the contact information is going to be in the video. You can reach out to me. We can talk. We can set up a time. Join with, join with me, excuse me, join with me as we pray to end this segment. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you. I thank you so much that you have given us evidence that you don't ask us to believe with a, a blind faith. You don't ask us to believe in you. Uh, just because uh, just because you claim to be who you are. But you give us reasons and you give us evidence and you give us a firm foundation upon which we can base our faith. So I pray that you will help myself and each one of the young people or older people who are listening to this or watching this to sanctify you in our hearts. In other words, to give you a special place in our minds and be ready always to answer anyone who has a question about our faith with meekness and fear. I thank you so much, and I pray these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.